After Jenny died, Annie had only one wish to escape, to put Toop's story behind her. Annie knew very well that it was easy to walk out of the big wooden gates. But she also knew that it wasn't so easy to stay out. She'd need somewhere to go, a home or at least a job. No one wanted Annie out there. She was too little and too blind to hold down a job for pay. To stay on the outside, Annie would need help. And within the year, it seemed that she might get it. A new priest had been assigned to Tewksbury. Father Babaria was his name. He came every Sunday to hold mass in the women's ward. And on Saturday, he came to be our confession. This was all that was expected of Father Barbara, by his church, by the Tewksbury officials, by the old ladies. But the poor house haunted this priest. He took to dropping in for no special reason. He joked a bit and gossiped with the old ladies. He swapped sports stories with the men. All the while, he kept his eye on Annie. And Annie watched the priest. Whenever their eyes met, hers would break away. Silent Annie, still grieving for her brother. It wasn't time to be friends with anyone yet. But even when she looked away quickly, she could see Father Barbara's warm smile. Each time the priest came, Annie crept closer and closer to that smile. She began to follow him as he went from bed to bed, ward to ward. Months passed. Then suddenly, there they were, walking along together and chatting. Father Barbara was Annie's friend. Every time the priest left the poorhouse grounds, he gave Annie a special warm smile and a pat on her head. Then there came the day when he gave Annie Sullivan something more, a promise. They were standing by the yellow gate. Father Barbara looked down at her, frowning. This is no place for you, Annie, he burst out. I'm taking you away from here. Father Barbara knew that her eyes were very weak now, that she could see almost nothing. He had a friend, a very skillful doctor at the Sisters of Charity Hospital in Lowell, Massachusetts. He planned to take Annie there, if anything could be done for her, thought Father Barbara, this was the man to do it. After her eyes were taken care of, he would find a house for the child, somewhere away from Tewksbury, but first the eyes. Almost exactly a year to the day that Annie and Jimmy had rolled up to Tewksbury in the Black Maria, Annie left with Father Barbara. He took her directly to the hospital. The doctor examined Annie at once. I think we can help, he told the priest. Yes, I think we can. The operation was performed soon after. For many days, Annie was forced to lie still with the bandages across her eyes. Then, one morning, a long procession filled into her room. The doctor, the nursing nuns, all clustered behind and laughed, Father Barbara. 
Slowly, the doctor snipped off the bandages. Open your eyes, Anne, he said gently. And when she obeyed, her heart corkscrewed down through her stomach. But everything was still so blurred. Oh, how blurred. Why, it was worse than before. All Anne could see was white and dark gray shadows. The operation was a failure. I won't go back to the poorhouse, Annie cried. The priest hugged her. The doctor told her there would be another operation. She was not to worry or to lose hope. She mustn't be unhappy. Unhappy? Annie was jubilant. They were going to keep her here for another operation. She didn't have to go back, not yet. For the first time in her life, Annie was surrounded by gentle people, people who liked her, people who thought she was bright, who liked to listen to the things that she said. It was a lovely time, but it didn't last long enough. There was another operation, then another. None of them helped. Finally, the doctors decided that they had done all that they could for Annie. The hospital was a place for the sick, and Annie wasn't sick. She was blind. She'd have to go, but where? Father Barbara was no longer there to take care of her. He had been called away to another part of the country. Nobody else wanted her. We'll have to send her back, Annie overheard the doctor whisper to a nurse one day. She knew what that meant. She screamed and clung to the doctor with all her strength. No, no, she cried and almost broke her hearts, their hearts. But the hospital authorities had no choice. They called for the Black Maria. Nobody paid much attention to Annie's return. Annie felt as if she were drowning in her misery. But under the pain of coming back to Tewksbury, a determination was growing. She meant to get out. She made no secret of her resolve, though the old woman jeered at her. What made Annie think she was better than anyone else? The old people found it easy to jeer at Annie. I don't care what any of you think, Annie cried. I'm going to leave. And my pretty, what will you do then? I'll go to school. This always brought a round of laughter. Annie's few friends hoped she'd forget this nonsense, forget impossible dreams, for they knew that dreams had a way of breaking your heart. Even kindly Maggie Carroll, and a special friend, said gently, You're blind, Annie. You can't get along out there. Tewksbury's your home. It's God's will. I don't care if I am blind. I'm going to get out of here. And then I'm going to stay out. I'm going to go to school, some school, and I don't see what God's got to do with it anyway. Shame, Annie. Maggie was shocked. But Annie didn't hear. She flung herself out of the room. The months went by, then the years. 1878, 1879, 1880. Annie was still at Tewksbury. She was almost totally blind and no closer to her dreams. Sometimes even Annie forgot her determination to escape. But it was a thing that never left for long. She would get out.
One day, Annie's old blind friend said, I don't know whether I should tell you this, Annie. I'll just get your hopes up for nothing. But you, um... But did you know that there are schools especially for the blind? Annie's breath caught where I could learn to read? Yes, if you could get in. Cousin Stacia's voice seemed to come out of the past. Don't be a fool, Annie. With those eyes of yours, you can never learn to read and write. If her eyes had been poor then, how much worse they were now. Why, on the record book of Tewksbury, she was down as virtually blind, Annie began to shake with anger. It's a trick, she cried. You're just being cruel. How can I read with these? Annie banged her hand across her eyes. The old lady dropped until, um, about until she found Annie's other hand. She held it for a moment. With this, my dear, and she squeezed Annie's hand. You can learn to read raised letters with your fingertips, with your hands. That's the way for the blind. Now Annie knew there was a place to go. But how to get there? Nobody inside the Tewksbury walls cared to help her enough. How could she expect help from the outside? How could she communicate with anyone out there? She couldn't write a letter. She was too blind to walk the unfamiliar streets. How? Annie thought endlessly about this problem. Without real help. Then suddenly, in 1880, the outside world came to Tewksbury. Most of the time, the people of Massachusetts ignored their state courthouse. But once in a while, rumors would circulate about conditions there. Rumors so awful that they had to be looked into. This year, there was to be such an investigation. Tewksbury did indeed need to be best investigated. In 1875, 80 babies had been born there, and 70 of them died before the winter was out. The, building, the buildings were fire traps. There was never enough medicine to go around in the sick wards. The food was full of weevils. The building housed rats so bold they attacked people in broad daylight. Um, the men who ran Tewksbury weren't cruel. All the state gave them to feed and house and clothe each person there was one dollar and seventy five cents a week. So they just did their job with what they had. Death, disease, dirt, indifference. That's what one seventy five a week bought a person at Tewksbury. Now the Massachusetts State Board of Charities had heard the rumors and were coming to investigate. The old people didn't expect much. They'd seen other investigations. Oh, the men would come. They'd, sh they'd cluck. They'd even be shocked. Then they'd go away talking about reform. The weevils would stay on the floor, um, in the flower. The rats would still attack people. Nothing would change. 
but Annie expected the same. She expected to be discovered. She expected the investigation committee to find her and send her to school. One day, Maggie Carroll told Annie something she had overheard. Frank B. Sanborn's his name, she said. He's the important one. He's the head of the whole group. Talk to him and you might get out. Annie remembered the name and she waited. Finally, the day came when word flashed through the wards. They're here. The committee came. They sampled the food. They appeared in two rat holes. They clucked. Annie followed them from building to building. Hour after hour, all over Tewksbury. She couldn't see them, but she stumbled after the sound of their voices. All day, she tried to work up the courage to talk to these important sounding men. Then it was all over. The committee was standing by the yellow gate, shaking hands with the director of Tewksbury. In a moment, they would be gone without hearing of her. Her chance would be gone. Annie didn't know which man was Mr. Frank B. Sanborn. It was too late to matter now. She had no time left. It's been very informative, a gray shape was saying. We'll send you our findings in a few weeks. Goodbye, another shape added. The gate began to close. Her last chance was going, and he hurled herself into the gray mass of men. Mr. Sanborn, Mr. Sanborn, she cried to all of them. I want to go to school. The director of Tewksbury tried to drag her away, but one of the voices stopped him. Wait, what's the matter with you, little girl, said the voice. I can't see, Annie managed to stutter. But I want to go to school. I want to go to the school for the blind. How long have you been here? Another voice asked. I don't know. The men asked a few more questions. Then they went away. That night Annie cried herself to sleep. She failed. She wasn't sure of it. But a few days later, one of the old women came hobbling into the ward. Annie, Annie, they told me to get you. You're in, um, you're to put your clothes together. You're leaving here. Mr. Sanborn had enrolled her as a charity pupil in the Parkins Institutions for the Blind, not 20 miles away in Boston. Annie Sullivan was going to school. Her friends quickly stitched together two new dresses. The first she had in years. One was blue with black flowers. The other was red. Annie chose to wear the red one on leave, taking another day. Many of the people she lived with for four years at Tewksbury followed her down to the gate. Nobody loved her. Nobody hugged her. Nobody kissed her goodbye, but their advice flew thick and fast. Be a good girl. Write us a letter as soon as you know how. Imagine our Annie. Don't answer back like you do here. Come visit us sometime. The driver, Tim, helped her up into the seat beside him. Uh, as the Black Maria...